once again I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and uh, I welcome you to the presentation of today as I promised yesterday in the night that um, we will be doing a, a video presentation on uh, Doodle Can Write and uh, this is part of the response uh, on uh, the article and the document that has been put outside there by the Central uh, Kenya Conference, the attack on the Godhead. Uh, we are taking you through the responses. And uh, this is uh, what was dealt on on day four. Uh, talking about the apostasy of uh, Dudley Marvin Conrad, uh, who left the church, and uh, it is alleged by the author of the article, the pastor, that uh, Dudley Conrad uh, left the church because uh, he did not believe in God, the Holy Spirit, and so that is why he became an apostate. This is the document that officially is being used in the camp meetings in a Central Kenya conference, the attack on the doctrine of uh, the Trinity, a document authored by Pastor Jeremy Mwenda Marambi. And we have been doing responses and we are on the second last presentation. And this is on the presentation on day four, which uh, talks about uh, uh, Dudley Marvin uh, can write and his apostasy and so as I promised I'll be doing a video presentation of today I welcome all of you to the presentation of today and this is what uh, uh, the pastor writes Dudley M. Can write 1840 to 1919 he claimed if the three persons in the Trinity are one and equal with the others then the Holy Spirit is just a truly an individual intelligent person as is the father of the son but this we cannot believe. The Holy Spirit is not a person. The truth is evident. The Holy Spirit is not a person, not an individual, but is an influence or power from the Godhead. In one of his earliest articles on the personhood of the Holy Spirit, said that the Holy Spirit is Christ's personal representative in the field. is only an influence in view of the work he does. The Holy Spirit is not an influence, nor an impression, nor peace, nor joy, nor anything. The Holy Spirit gives peace and gives joy, assures, in grief makes an impression, exacts an influence. The Holy Spirit is a person eternally, a divine person, and he must be always recognized and spoken of as a person, or he is not truly recognized or spoken of at all. And so this is what he had to teach on day four. And uh, let us look at the apostasy of uh, Brother Dudley, the letter. Dudley Marvin can write and uh, it is uh, a disservice to give such a short document in your presentation and uh, never give people the whole truth or link them to the whole truth. What I'm now going to present to you is uh, the information that is outside there and uh, it has been certified and uh, this is being brought to you by Gospel Sounders and uh, this is Sammy Wilberforce. Uh, we are uh, dedicated to carrying the three angels' messages around the world, around the globe. And so let us uh, delve into this uh, issue of uh, Dudley Canwright. And uh, uh, in this presentation, I'll be borrowing from uh, uh, an article by uh, Brother Jason Smith, uh, his article on the uncounted factor it is there for ten dollars and uh, I encourage you to be able to purchase this and uh, that booklet and be able to uh, read of it yourself the whole issue it is 70 pages but I'm, I've just taken a few sentiments from the book and uh, that is what I'm going to use you are uh, encouraged to uh, buy the book and uh, be able to get the whole information. I have put uh, this article that I'm going to use, the one that I have wrote, uh, the reactionary theology. When you go on my timeline on Facebook, you'll be able to see the document and read it yourself. It is worth reading it. And uh, 
uh, how I pray that um, uh, you will be able to go and uh, read it. And so I want us to pray as we invoke the Lord to be with us and uh, his holy angels to guide us in this presentation. Father in heaven, thank you. We approach the throne of mercy in confidence that you will guide us in whole truth. And so help us not to be shaken by anything but Lord continue in the truth once delivered to the saints. Let thy will continue uh, being uh, the center of our affection and uh, our guidance in our, our daily life. Thank you for the gift of the Sabbath, Lord. And as we look at uh, the issues at stake, Lord, may you help the children understand the truth of the time and uh, be able to follow it. Give us strength to walk in thy will in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so, uh, let us look at uh, these things in depth. Let us look at uh, these things in depth. And uh, I hope they be of benefit unto you. Uh, so as I have told you, the half of this article is Brother Jason Smith's work, The Uncounted Factor. And uh, I owe him gratitude for such elaborate research on this matter of reactionary theology and how Trinity was brought into Adventism. First of all, we have to know that uh, Dude Lucan Wright was not uh, uh, a Trinitarian when he left uh, Seventh-day Adventist. He became a Trinitarian when he went outside there. And the things that he believes, he left the Adventist church because they did not believe in the Holy Spirit as uh, a person, as people believe a person to be. And uh, which means that actually that time Adventism was uh, not uh, believing in Trinity. He went outside and believed in the Trinity. And now the version of the Trinity he believed when he went outside is the one we believe. And so if Dudley Canwright went away because of apostasy, then it means that he could have come if the church was in truth, but he never came. Uh, uh, Dudley Marvin uh, Canwright uh, was a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church for 22 years, who later left the church and became one of its severest critics. He joined the church in 1859 at the age of 19 and rose through the ministry to a position of prominence on the General Conference, a committee of uh, Seventh-day uh, Adventism. In his early life, and uh, this information, you can find it in the documents that uh, I've told you about uh, uh, by brother Jason Smith. So, uh, his early life, Dudley Marvin Canwright was born in farmhouse near Kinderhook, Michigan on September 22, 1840 to Hiram and Loretta Canwright. In 1859, at the age of 19, Dudley journeyed eastwards to attend the Albion Academy Academy in Albion, New York, to support himself. He worked as a farm hand for Elder Roswell F. Cottrell, a Seventh day Adventist minister. In the summer of 1859, he attended a camp meeting held by uh, Elder James White near Albion. There, he accepted the doctrine of the Advent message and was soon baptized, uh, was soon uh, baptized into the Seventh day Adventist church. Dudley briefly served as secretary to Elder White. Uh, who encouraged him to enter the ministry for five years after converting his entire family to Adventism. He served as an evangelist for the Seventh-day Adventist Church and traveling and preaching across the Mid-East, Western U.S. In 1865, at the age of 24, Dudley Canwright was ordained by James White and J.M. Lofborough in a service held at uh, Battle Creek. Uh, Dunley Canwright uh, continued his evangelistic career preaching throughout New England in 1867. He married Lucretia Cranston, 19 years old, often partially brought up by E.G. White. Miss and Miss Canwright had three children, two of whom survived infancy. The life of traveling minister's wife was harsh for Miss Canwright, and in 1879 she succumbed to tuberculosis. Two years later, Dudley was remarried to Miss Lucy Hayden. 
their union produced four children of whom three of whom survived infancy. What is the story behind uh, this whole issue, the nominational history textbook for Seventh-day Adventist College classes by R.H. Schwarz? This is what we find uh, about uh, Doodle, that uh, during his brief period as an Adventist minister, Hall had written the Bible from heaven, a book designed to demonstrate the divine origin of the scriptures and the basis for considering them authoritative in matters of religious faith and practice. Fifteen years later, Dudley M. Canwright published a revision edition of this book. At that time, Canwright was also leading a leading Adventist minister by within two decades he would turn into the most and to the most widely quoted and controversial critic of advancing in the entire period of the church's existence. Conrad accepted Seventh-day Adventism in 1859 as a young man of 19. Two years later, James White presented him with a Bible and set uh, of prophetic charts. He gave him a prophetic chart so that um, he may uh, do the, the work of the Lord. And uh, uh, this uh, he continued in and uh, we found that uh, he journeyed across the land uh, preaching uh, messages uh, uh, he was ordained by James White and uh, Jane Lovebra at the age of 24 and uh, dispatched to New England to work under Jane Andrews it was here that he adopted the practice of debating with ministers of other Protestant churches uh, Conrad demonstrated against uh, demonstrated considerable debating skill and was commended by Jane Andrews for his zealous, devoted, and faithful labors. Yet there was a darker side in the development of this young minister as well. He experienced a period of acute depression and doubt. His diary reveals that he recognized ugly characters in his life. In his um, uh, biography, uh, we read that pride, self-exaltation, and the spirit of harshness toward others led him to fear for his uh, eternal salvation. This is uh, Dudley Canwright that we are speaking about and his uh, apostasy. Why are we speaking about Dudley Canwright? Because the pastor has said that um, he did not believe in uh, God, the Holy Spirit. That's why he, he, did, he apostatized. And it is true that he didn't believe in uh, God, the Holy Spirit. He believed in the Spirit of God. And uh, when he became a a Sunday keep after apostasy, he started believing in Trinity, the same thing that we are believing today. And so if the church was on the right, then we have to see Dudley Canwright coming back to the church, but this is not something we see. Uh, at a time in 1869, uh, he transferred to Iowa to work under George uh, I. Butler. And uh, this uh, he worked there for nearly 20 years. But uh, one evening, uh, Butler was surprised to find that uh, Canwright uh, was uh, toying with the idea of giving up all religious faith. Everything that he had believed in, he was now wanting to back up from it and uh, relinquish what he believed in. This was just after he had completed a successful debate with Sunday ministers. Uh, J. G. I. Butler took him aside and uh, uh, they prayed together, discouraged uh, uh, with, with this discouraged man, and uh, he was able to get him out of this crisis of wanting to leave the denomination. And uh, they, they went on a vacation with the, the whites. That is, Dudley Canwright went on a uh, on a vacation with the uh, the, uh, the whites family in Colorado Mountains in the summer of 1873. And uh, first of all, the vacation went out nicely, and uh, it was a benefit to this uh, man, Dudley Canwright, for he was in this limbo. He was in this. Uh, uh, um, doubtful mind of living Seventh-day Adventist and so being together with the whites that is James White and E.J. White helps him a bit 
uh, when they were in Colorado in 1873, James White became quite ill, and Ellen, Ellen White was burdened with the caring for uh, James White. You can read this in the life sketches of uh, E.G. White. And then uh, at this point, uh, Conrad's 15 month old daughter turned cranky actually. Nerves in need of healing were frayed instead. And uh, when the whites uh, tried to cancel this uh, younger couple concerning what they deemed some character weakness, they exploded. And uh, this is at the time uh, that, that actually separation started taking place. So they, they moved out of Colorado that year. They left the whites there. That is uh, uh, in the year 1873. And uh, he took his wife and a child to California. And uh, he became now determined to leave the ministerial career. But uh, remember that he's not leaving the Seventh Day Adventism because of uh, the doctrine of. Uh, uh, God uh, and the Trinity issue. He, he wants to leave everything. He, he was a man who was seeking after, uh, after ambitions. We shall see this. And uh, for several months, he worked on a farm, but the need of preachers in California was great. So he, he relinquished, he moved out. Uh, he abandoned his ministerial career for some time, but for Several months he worked uh, on his farm, but the need of uh, preachers in California was great. Soon Conrad was back holding evangelistic meetings. A reconciliation between the whites took place, and uh, he started recognizing the prophetic gift of uh, uh, Sister Ellen White. And uh, soon he became even an apologetic of uh, E.G. White. And uh, he, he debated, and uh, he... He, he met the controversy that was being brought by men like Miles Grand as Sunday Keeping Adventist. Uh, but uh, after some time, again, uh, uh, he continued his resentment upon uh, against uh, uh, Sister White. And uh, during 1876, Conrad spent much of the summer on the camp meeting circuit throughout the East and Midwest. That year, along with James White and uh, S.N. Haskell, he was elected to the three member. General Conference Executive Committee. And the following year, he published, uh, that is in 1877, he published a strong defense of the whites in the review and series of articles called uh, A Plain Talk to Mamaras. Uh, this is what uh, Dudley Conrad wrote about uh, Miss White. If I have any judgment, any special discernment, I pronounce the testimonies to be of the same spirit and of the same tenor as the scriptures. So this is a guy who understood what was in Adventism. But uh, increasing responsibility came Conrad's way. He was elected as president of the Sabbath School Association and of the Ohio Conference. He was active in developing the tithing plan. Some suspected that he hoped to succeed White, James White as a general conference president in 1878. If this was so, he was disappointed because it never happened. Fellow Adventist uh, leaders did not consider him as steady enough to lead the entire church. In 1879, uh, the wife, Lucretta Conrad, died after heartbreaking struggle with uh, against uh, tuberculosis. It was a hard blow for, although Conrad had not always appeared as a considerate of his wife as he might have been, he loved her dearly. And uh, now he had two small children to care for alone. So for some time, he experienced a uh, um, problem with his voice and throat. Uh, and uh, this was suspected it is because of his habit of incorrect speaking. So in the summer of 1888, he decided to spend some weeks in Chicago attending the Hamill School of Oratory. He hoped that through a thorough study in and master of expression, he would, could accomplish his consuming desire to be a popular public speaker. Here is a, a story, and it's not good to judge the motives, but uh, according to the wavering uh, uh, um, instances of Dudley Conrad, it was a man uh, who was actually uh, fighting between um, two opinions, a man who was not decided in, um, uh, in his uh, spiritual journey. One of the instances recorded 
in build the camera is the uh, life and uh, like it to be projected. An incident that occurred during the course of the summer provides a revealing picture of Kanra's thinking. As part of his practical work in Ham Mills uh, School, he had just completed speaking to more than 3,000 people in one of Chicago's most popular Protestant churches. For more than half an hour, members of the congregation had praised around him, complimenting him on a masterly discourse. Now he was quietly discussing the evening with a fellow Adventist Hamill student who had attended the service to act as his professional critic. Suddenly, Conrad sprang to his feet and explained, exclaimed, I believe as I could become, I believe I could become a great man were it not for our unpopular messages. We shall see what is this unpopular messages that Dudley Conrad actually sees. D.W. Reavis, to whom this statement was made, was shocked. DM, he said solemnly, the message made you all you are, and the day you leave it, you will retrace your steps back to where it found you. So this is a guy who was seeking uh, uh, eminence in life, but uh, the eminence he was seeking, it was not uh, the right thing. He was not seeking the eminent in the right thing. And so this began his fall. This began his fall. And so for four months, he traveled throughout Michigan, Wisconsin, holding classes in uh, elocution, that is uh, language and uh, oratory and speech. During part of this time, he later told Butler he ceased observing the Sabbath uh, and seriously considered seeking a preaching assignment from the Methodists because the guy had been praised by the Sunday keepers on how he handled the debates. Now he ceased keeping the Sabbath. Brothers and sisters, you understand what is happening. When you receive the praise due to God and you don't give him glory, this is how you fall. So he saw that it was, he was so unappreciated, and he could have been the Seventh-day Adventist president, as some say, but the brethren did not appreciate, appreciate him as he should. And so he left keeping the Sabbath and uh, considered uh, seeking a preaching assignment from the Methodist. But uh, in 1881, following extended talks with Butler and the Whites, Conrad once more began ministerial labor. And so you are seeing him how he's unstable. Uh, so he extended his ministerial labor until 1882 from 1881. This time he announced that his decision to stop preaching for Adventists was due to the fact that he had become thoroughly satisfied that the visions are not from God, but are only the fruit of her, Miss White, own imagination. So the, the, the main, when you look at the story of uh, brother, the late brother Dudley Marvin Conrad, you find that um, there was a lot of self-seeking in him, and uh, he was wavering between if E.G. White is a prophet or is not a prophet, because you find him attacking the uh, the sister so much, and this led to his downfall. When you fight the servants of the Lord, this is your downfall. And uh, later, 1881, uh, later in 1881, uh, James White died. And uh, at that time, G.I. Butler was the general conference president. And uh, um, Dudley Conrad actually had a lot of hard feelings uh, against uh, Butler and other Adventist leaders, excepting Miss White. And uh, she, she said that he said that he disliked her very much indeed. These feelings persisted. Throughout the two years, Conrad formed near Otsego, Michigan. Then, in response to an appeal from Butler, he attended an Adventist camp meeting at Jackson. Again, there was were long hours of prayer and counsel with him, with uh, G.I. Butler, and uh, it climaxed in a public confession of his struggle with doubt and bitter feelings towards Ellen White. Upon his knees, Conrad begged Miss White for forgiveness. When this was freely given, he repented. Uh, uh, he repented of it for the first time, and uh, they made up with Sister White. She didn't have a hard feeling against him, and uh, they moved on. But again, once more, 
Kanwright publicly professed his determination to stay uh, away from Adventist church. And uh, although he had just said that uh, now he was okay with Adventist church, in one of the records we are told that um, Kanwright publicly professed his determination to stay uh, in Adventist this time and not waver his faith, come what may. Quoted, I will never do this backing up anymore, he told a general Adventist convocation in his home church. And I believe that if I ever go back from this, I'm lost. Soon he was traveling widely, attending Adventist meeting in the East and in Iowa and Minnesota. Shortly thereafter, a new tribulation assailed Edla Canwright. In the spring of 1881, he had remarried, and uh, it was James White who officiated the marriage with uh, uh, Miss uh, Lucy. Uh, and uh, the, uh, in, in 1885, uh, Conrad was uh, on assignment in England, and he received word that his 14-month-old son was seriously ill. Uh, Conrad tarried for several days, hoping the child would improve. When he finally arrived home, the boy was dead. And uh, it is quoted, he said, it seems as though it will not be so, that we cannot have it so. The district father wrote Ellen White, and yet it is so. Uh, poor Lucy, it almost killed her, and my own heart feels as though it will break. I cannot see why this should come upon. And so this, this uh, culminated in... Uh, uh, depression and uh, the the guy was discouraged in some way and uh, seeing that uh, he was not grounded in his spiritual uh, life uh, it it again brought a shaking in his life and uh, he continued in uh, uh, continued active in Adventist ministry almost every issue of the review carried an article from his pen many devoted to the strong defense of specific Adventist doctrine he his most famous entitled to those in Doubting Castle contained a strong line of argument in support of the particular role Ellen White occupied in the church. In closing, he identified what he considered the root cause of doubt and dissatisfaction in the church. And uh, this is what he writes in uh, his own confession. The real trouble lies close at home, Conrad wrote, in a proud and converted heart, a lack of real humility and unwillingness to submit to God's way of finding the truth. So... Uh, he admits, Conrad himself admits that he was an unconverted man and that is why he was having this struggle of uh, in and out uh, uh, moves in Adventism and the world. Through 1885 and 1886, Conrad's services to this church were many and uh, varied. For eight weeks, he taught Rice Smith's uh, Bible classes at Battle Creek College in order that Smith might devote his time to other tasks. Uh, Conrad served as a member of the editorial board of a uh, short-lived uh, missionary journal, uh, The Gospel Sequel. He prepared a series of Sabbath school lessons for the youth instructor, and in an effort to strengthen churches without regular pastors, Conrad was asked to visit and hold meetings with 18 Michigan congregations. Um, Although he participated in all these things, there was still a dissatisfaction in his heart of who he should be and what he should be and uh, his religious uh, experience was not stable and uh, in January 1887 this is the saddest report that uh, the conference ever received and the president of general conference ever received in January 1887 Conrad informed G.I. Butler that he could no longer be a Seventh day Adventist this is the story of uh, Dudley Conrad why are we talking about Dudley Canwright? Pastor Jeremy, in his article, The Attack on the Doctrine of the Trinity and Godhead, he said that Dudley Canwright left Adventism because Adventism did not believe in the person of, the God, uh, of, the, uh, of God, the Holy Spirit. And so he went outside there. Now, when Canwright went outside there, as I have said, he be started believing in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And if the church really at its infants believed in that, then Dudley Canwright could have not gone away. And if the church became right, then if this is the thing that made Canwright go out, when the church adopted Trinity, he could have come in. But this is not the case. The case of Trinity and non-Trinity issue is not the major issue that actually uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, made can right to apostatize from Adventism. It was a matter of dissatisfaction of a man who he wanted to be. Uh, the ambitions he had and the unconverted heart he had. And you can see in his anger and in criticism of Adventism that actually he was bent to evil and not good and his heart was not uh, uh, actually converted. And so in January 1887, Cambridge informed Butler that he could no longer be a Seventh-day Adventist. Butler then journeyed to Otsego to preside over a business session of Cambridge's home church. Uh, at this meeting, Cambridge made it clear that he no longer believed. Now, I, I want you to listen well, and uh, because this is what made uh, Cambridge leave Seventh-day Adventism, not the story of the Trinity and uh, non-Trinity issue. And uh, I like to blow this on the screen so that uh, we may be able to see it together. I hope you are being blessed wherever you are. And uh, when uh, ministers decide to put outside there uh, documents that actually is a misinformation, the children of God should rise up and defend what is truth because it's not good for people to be just misinformed in defending some doctrines. And so this is uh, what we have. Uh, uh, at this meeting, Conrad made it clear that he no longer believed the Ten Commandments were binding upon Christians, and he had given up the law, the Sabbath, the three angels' messages, the sanctuary, our position about U.S. in prophecy, the testimonies, health reform, the ordinance of humility. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to recognize the things that made uh, Dudley Cunwright go outside Adventism. The, the issue of Trinity is not mentioned here at all. The things that Dudley confessed to G.I. Butler, and this is a confession. Let me go up a little bit. Let me go up. There it is. In January 1887, Conrad informed Butler that he could no longer be a Seventh-day Adventist. Continued on. Let me now scroll it down so that uh, we may be able to travel together. Butler then journeyed to Oswego to preside over business session of Conrad's home chat. At this meeting, Conrad made it clear that, quote, this is a report from G.I. Butler and you don't see a mention of Trinity in it. This is what Conrad uh, confessed, that he no longer believed in, one, Ten Commandments, two, that Ten Commandments were binding to Christian, two, he had given up the law, the Sabbath, the three angels' messages, the sanctuary, our position U.S. As in prophecy, the testimonies, health reform, and ordinance of humility. That is uh, the Lord's Supper. So these are the things that Dudley Conrad did not believe in, and Trinity is not mentioned or non-Trinity thing. So Pastor Marambi is saying that actually Dudley Marvin Conrad left Adventism because of the Trinity, non-Trinity thing. The president of the General Conference actually is informing us that this is not the issue. But we shall see later how actually Dudley Conrad came to be a critic of Seventh-day Adventist attacking it and the doctrine of the Trinity. In view of his expressed doctrinal differences, the Oswego Seventh-day Adventist Church felt they had little choice other than to withdraw fellowship from Conrad and his wife, who agreed with him. But Butler reported that Conrad had assured the church that he thought there was a larger percentage of true Christian among our people than among any other denomination. So even while Dudley Conrad is going out and he doesn't believe in all this doctrine, he's telling G.I. Butler that he believes there are more Christians in Adventism more than in other denominations. So this, this is a guy who the devil was sifting his heart. And it's not good to talk about the dead because they cannot defend themselves. But I'm quoting what actually is coming from um, the eyewitnesses. And so he professed no hard feelings towards church leaders. And uh, 
nor any dissatisfaction over the way he had been treated. To Ellen White Cunwright wrote, For my part, I earnestly wish that there might continue to be a friendly feeling between me and our people, SDS. On my part, it shall be so. So as even he's moving outside the church, he still uh, believes that uh, he wanted to have a good uh, relationship uh, uh, with the church and he had no ill feelings uh, against against uh, the church. Continued on, we are looking at the story of Dudley Marvin Canwright because it had been said that uh, he left SDA because of the doctrine of Trinity and non-Trinity. So what precipitated Canwright's final break with the church he had served for 20 years has been a matter of debate down to the present. People still debate why Canwright left the church and as you have seen in the article, uh, that it's being discussed, and here it is. People have been undecided. People don't know why Canwright actually left the church. The pastor says that here he left because of the doctrine of uh, the Holy Spirit is not God. But uh, what we are finding is mixed uh, uh, witnesses, uh, reports. And so what happened? One of the elders... Relatives felt it was due to the, his failure to be elected president of the Michigan Conference in the fall of 1886, when actually James White was coming out from the presidency in 1887. And so he thought one of his relatives thought that this was the thing. Uh, president G.I. Butler, who had worked to dispel Conrad's doubts probably as much as any other man, put his finger on what he considered rights Canwright's basic character weakness. When everything went there well, pleasantly to Canwright, uh, he could usually see things with clearness. But when things went bad, he could not see things good, and his spirituality will grow dim. And so dark clouds of unbelief floated over his mental sky, and he felt that everything was going uh, not as he wished they could go. This was his weakness, and this, uh, and this towing between uh, uh, his spirituality made him, according to G.I. Butler, live a Seventh Day Adventist. But uh, what does Conrad himself say that made him live Adventism? What does he have to tell us? Conrad, of course, had a different version as to why he separated from Seventh-day Adventists. In a letter to the local newspaper, he reported that he had doubted some points of Adventist doctrine for years. Uh, he had become fully satisfied that keeping the Seventh-day is an error, productive of evil rather than good. He was certain that Miss White Vision were only the imaginations of her own minds. Adventists, he also maintained, were too narrow and exclusive in their feelings toward other churches. Some time later, Conrad avowed, had I desired office or better position, all I had to do was to go right along without wavering, and position would have come to me faster than I could fill them. General Christians opposed to Seventh-day Adventist doctrine have accepted Conrad's explanation that he could no longer intellectually accept Adventist beliefs. And we are not just talking about um, the Trinity issue. But uh, even uh, when he went away, he maintained a friendly, uh, uh, a cordial uh, 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 environment with uh, the Seventh-day Adventist. But uh, something that uh, moved him to now start hating Adventism. What, what made uh, Canwright start hating Adventism so much? Uh, Conrad became uh, disturbed over a reference in the review which referred to his apostasy and made a thinly veiled comparison between him and Judas Iscariot. This angered him so much. Although Conrad was not mentioned by name in later articles commenting on the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, he felt that um, the review and Herald people were talking about him. And so he started his attack on Adventism. And so uh, he later joined uh, the 
Otsego Baptist Church and uh, he was ordained a uh, Baptist minister. And uh, this is when he began a 30-year campaign to discredit Seventh-day Adventism by voice and by pen. Why? Because he felt that people in Adventist and Review were comparing him to Judas Iscariot, Korah Dathan, and Abiram. And so he started his attack on Seventh-day Adventism and criticizing it sharply. Continued on. Uh, many of the Protestant churches, they knew Conrad so well and how he was a good debater. And uh, they used him freely to prove how Seventh-day Adventist belief was heresy. Uh, and uh, they were successful in luring him to these things. And uh, uh, after, after joining the Baptist church, in the, after joining the Baptist church, uh, Canwright uh, began his campaign against Adventism and uh, in 1889, Conrad published a 413-page book, a famous book called Seventh Day Adventist Renown. And uh, this this was a, a classic book that was used by evangelical and Protestants Protestantism against uh, uh, Adventism. By Conrad's death in 1919, it had gone through 14 printings and was widely circulated in many parts of. Uh, the world outside the United States. During his last years, Conrad composed a, a life on Miss E.G. White, which was published uh, post, uh, posthumously. Uh, that is uh, a derogative, uh, derogatory uh, tone, that is to discredit the work of uh, E.G. White. Far from being a biography, as the title would imply, it was a bitter and uh, sometimes sarcastic attack designed to discredit Miss White. Uh, some of the points that were covered in the 1889 uh, 413-page book, Seventh Day Adventist Renowned, were one, E.G. White was a great plagiarist. Number two, E.G. White was suppressing some of her earlier writings that were embarrassing. Number three, E.G. White using her gift to profit financially. Number four, uh, yielding to human influences. Number five, making false prophecies. And number six, teaching incorrect doctrine from the shut door to the reform dress. These were some of the things that uh, he put in a 413-page book, Seventh Day uh, Renowned. And so, after he left in 1887, he continued in this bondage. I call it bondage because uh, he was being used as a puppet by the other religions to uh, prove that Seventh-day Adventist was uh, uh, a cult and a heretic, uh, uh, not a cult, but a heretical denomination. Although while he was doing this, he, uh, he, he remained friendly with Seventh-day uh, friends. And uh, one of the most uh, moving experience is recorded by D.W. Reeves, to whom uh, Conrad years earlier had confided that he believed he could be a great man, were it not for unpopular messages of Adventism. At the end of a long talk, Frank talked one day in 1903, Reeves appealed to Conrad to confess his errors to his Adventist brethren and once more join them in heralding Christ's final message to the world. Uh, Conrad uh, told uh, Revis, uh, D.W. Revis, that I never heard anyone weep. Uh, th this is what uh, D. Revis is reporting. I never heard anyone weep and mourn in such a deep condition as that one's leading light in our message did. Revis remembered. He said he wished he could come back to the fold as uh, Revis suggested, but after long heartbreaking mourns and weeping, he said, 
I will be glad to come back, but it can't. It is too late. So in 1903, D.W. Reeves goes to him and tells him, my brother, you are in error. These things that you are doing are not the right thing. Come back to the denomination and let us do the message of uh, the Lord's return and said, I wish I will go back, but uh, it is too late. I believe it was not too late for Dudley, Marvin Conrad, but he said it is too late, forever gone, gone. That is what he told the virus. And uh, in uh, an interview with uh, D.W. Revis, he said that uh, the last word he heard from uh, uh, D.M. Conrad is, whatever you do, don't fight the message. Don't fight Adventism message. And so the guy, it's like he knew that uh, he had gone down the slope. And uh, because he had not this spiritual connection with Jesus Christ, he never saw Christ forgiving him and accepting him back to be a minister of the gospel. And so Conrad's attitude toward Ellen White also appears to have been uh, ambivalent. His life of Miss E.G. White was certainly uh, derogatory. Yet several years before this was issued, he uh, was issued. He told L.H. Christian that he had never met a woman so godly and kind and at the same time so unselfish, helpful and practical as Miss e. White. So Dudley Conrad is outside there. He has gone outside the church because he doesn't believe in the prophet. He doesn't believe in the three angels' messages. He doesn't believe in health reform. He doesn't believe in Ten Commandments. He doesn't believe in U.S. in prophecy as we are as Seventh-day Adventists teach. Nothing is mentioned of the Trinity. And yet he hates so Miss White so much, he writes books against her. Yet in an interview with W. Reeves, he tells W. Uh, Reeves that he should not fight Adventist message. And then with an interview with L.H. Christian, he tells Christian, this is what he tells Christian about Miss White. I never met a woman so godly and kind at the same time, so unselfish, helpful, and practical as Miss White. She was certainly a spiritual woman, a woman of prayer and deep faith in the Lord Jesus. Anyone who follows her writing, he continued, in prayer and faith will certainly get to heaven. So you look at the struggle of D.M. Conrad. Huh? The guy is struggling. Why is the guy struggling? Because he himself, he has written that his heart was unconverted. And he had some weakness in character. And uh, he felt unappreciated by brethren. And so this made him move outside Adventism. Yet here is the pull. Here is the Holy Spirit pulling him back to Adventism. Yet because of human frailties and how Satan will never let uh, the captives of his uh, uh, prison go free. Here he is confessing that he has never met a woman so ungodly. He has never met a woman so godly, sorry. A woman so kind, unselfish, helpful, and practical in her Christian journey. And he confesses anyone who follows her writings and continues in prayer and faith will certainly go to heaven. But here, he writes book against her. You can see the yin-yang of uh, uh, D.M. Conrad and how the devil is trying to play with his mind to pull him out of Christianity. And uh, 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 this is what Dudley Conrad tells L.H. Christian. She always, E.G. White, exalted Jesus and she taught true conversion and genuine sanctification. I have never seen others do this. Now, what will you say was the problem with D.M. Conrad? If this is the interview he has given, I have never met such a godly woman, such an unselfish, helpful, and practical in her Christian life. And she taught always, she exalted Jesus always. She taught the true conversion and genuine, genuine sanctification and never seen people do this.
uh, I'm left wondering why DM can't write actually uh, went away from Adventism and why he could not allow the Holy Spirit to work in his life. So I, 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 I know that Pastor Marandi will get this information. I believe that the, the Lord will make him get the information. D.M. Conrad did not leave Seventh day Adventism because of the Trinity and Trinity issue. He had his own personalities against Seventh day Adventism and the doctrines that he has a problem with is the sanctuary, the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath, laws on health, and uh, he has a problem with the uh, U.S. in prophecy as it is taught. This is the doctrine he has a problem with. And he has a problem with the visions of E.G. White. And the Trinity issue and non-Trinity issue is not mentioned. But he is writing materials against E.G. White. Yet at the same time, he is uh, actually saying in an interview in interviews how good E.G. White is. And so this, this was a guy, as he writes himself, Dudley Cameron writes himself, he struggled with the conversion of the heart. And this made him leave Seventh Day Adventist. So uh, it is so wrong when you read the, this document of uh, Pastor Marambi that uh, Dudley Canwright left Adventism because Adventism did not believe in God, the Holy Spirit. It is it's a misinformation, and just putting outside there a paragraph to the congregation and telling them that uh, they will end up as Dudley Canwright if they don't believe in the God, the Holy Spirit. It is wrong information. It is revising. This is revisionary history. It is revising our history and uh, the people who have been out of the scene. This is lying to the congregation brethren. And this information has to go to the all members of the churches to know that what has been presented is not truth because this is not the true history that has been presented. Continued on. Uh, much of this history is uh, is uh, is in the book that uh, Brother Jason Smith put outside there, the Uncounted Factor. It is a well-authored book, a 70-page book. You can purchase it at only $10, and it has valuable information that you may know about Dudley Canwright and uh, the history of Trinity coming in Adventism. I'll just put, uh, I'll just go through some few things in this uh uh, in this article by Jason Smith, and uh, it's not even uh, a lot. In 1889, Brother Jason Smith uh, has this, and uh, this is a research that has been done well. And uh, we have references there. You can see them when you take the book and when you go to my page and uh, look at uh, reactional theology that I have put there. Uh, Jason Smith reports in 1889, D.M. Conrad published his book, Seventh Day Adventist, Adventist in Renown. This book's import is best explained by the historian Gary Land. Gary Land says that his book, Seventh Day Adventist in Renown, became the chief weapon used by evangelical against Seventh Day Adventism. He had something against Adventism, and when he moved out, he wrote a book against it. Uh, the extent of... Uh, this book could be failed until 1950s. The extent, the damage that this book did could be seen in the years 1950s. And uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the debates of 1950s, the famous evangelical conference, uh, the materials were put there on the table before Leroy Froome by uh, Walter Martin Barnhouse, that is uh, Martin Bay Barnhouse, and uh, uh, about uh, what Seventh Day Adventists believe. And uh, one of the issues in the evangelical meeting. Uh, Ray uh, Barnhouse claimed that Adventism did not believe in the God in the Trinity, and then he poured out forth the materials to the table, and Leroy Froome were able to go through the materials, and they, they they said, really, we don't believe in this, and but it is because of a few people here and there, but this is not the official thing, and so Leroy Froome 
now went about and compiled the book evangelism. This is where the history of evangelism comes in. With the quotes that had the three persons uh, and all those quotes that tended to speak that uh, Adventism believed in Trinity. And uh, he wrote the book Evangelism and uh, it did a lot of harm to the Ministerial Institute uh, in those conferences. And uh, this is how Trinity started coming in Adventism. But uh, we are talking about Dudley M. Canwright. Uh, in uh, 1889 to 1899, his books criticizing Adventism received extensive free advertisement and was the chief weapon against Adventism because many religions hate, hated Adventism because of their of the messages. And uh, one of the things that also he wrote in the book uh, Seventh Day Adventist Renowned was the rejection of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But that's not what made him go outside Adventism. Uh, this uh, charge was later expanded from uh, his uh, later editions of uh, Conrad's books, and this was because uh, Brother Jason Smith believes that this was because of reactionary uh, theology. When you read his work, you will be able to see it. He, he, he thrust a lot of criticism against Adventism. And uh, I'll just read some of the things that uh, has been written here. When he started speaking about against Adventism, they started reacting back. They started reacting back. And uh, in one of the reactions, there was a... Uh, uh, a document that uh, Seventh Day Adventist adopted, which uh, uh, somehow implicated that uh, we believed in Trinity. Uh, document was, um, let me see, by who? Was it by Spicer? Uh, uh, a Presbyterian. Let me see if I can press. No. So I have to search for this. Mm. Yes, uh, in one of his, his attacks on Adventism, he wrote about uh, how he didn't believe in Trinity. This is uh, D.M. Canwright. And uh, Advent, Adventists, in their reaction in defending about what D.M. Canwright was doing, they put there, outside the, there, uh, uh, M.C. Wilcox put, published a, a document by Spear. The, the document by uh, Spear was uh, titled The Subordination of Christ, uh, Subordination of Christ. This, is, this was an article which was the uh, uh, M.C. Wilcox put there in 1891. And, uh, and so this document by... Uh, uh, spear was used as a catalyst against what D.M. Conrad was doing. So uh, they put it in the Adventist library, and uh, it was uh, an article entitled The Subordination of Christ. But when you look at the wording of uh, uh, Spear's document, it, it was not worded as a, a Trinitarian document, but the word Trinity was used in it. And so uh, uh, Wilcox put outside there the article to show that Adventism, this is they believed in the Trinity, but it was in a cunning manner, a reactionary theology, where actually somebody says that you don't believe in this and you put outside something to compart it, yet what you are putting out, actually, it doesn't match or mesh with what the other person is saying. So Spear had a document on subordination of Christ, and this is what Wilcox used to defend Adventism, that 
DM Canwright is saying that we don't believe in Trinity, but in our library, we have a, an article that speaks about Trinity. You understand what I'm saying? But actually, the document just spoke about a trio. That is, we have one God, the Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, and their Spirit. But it, it avoided the statements, three in one statements that you find in Trinitarian document. This is the document that spearhead outside there. And so, And so when uh, MC Wilcox put outside the document, Canwright knew very well what actually they had done. Because Canwright was one of the editors of the, of, of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination uh, uh, publication. And so he knew and he told them, no, Seventh-day Adventist doesn't believe in Trinity. They believe in something else. They don't believe that there is three in one God. And uh, 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 I'll go somewhere and read some of his remark and his um, how he was able to respond to this thing. Uh, so the article by the late Samuel Spear, it was taken from an uh, independent uh, uh, magazine and it was divided and uh, it was uh, later the renamed the, 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 the document was called uh, subordination of Christ and later it was put in, it was put in Adventist library and uh, the article was published as a part of public campaign called the Bible Students Library. According to the Seventh-day Adventist Encyclopedia, the series of pamphlets of the Bible Student Library were designed for the public, containing brief and pointed essays on Bible doctrines, the fulfillment of prophecy, and other SDA uh, aspects of teachings. M.C. Wilcox was chair of the editorial committee of this library for a number of years. And in, he, in this series, the title of Spears article was changed to read the Bible doctrine of Trinity. You remember the title was the subordination of Christ, but Wilcox changed, changed this to the Bible doctrine of Trinity so that to counter what D.M. Conrad is talking about at Benzim. So it is a reaction of theology that is happening here. And now this is where Trinity starts coming in in Adventism. Although the use of the word Trinity was not as it is today in Adventism. While they spoke of Trinity, they spoke of the Father, the Son, and their Spirit. A literal Father, a literal Son, and uh, their Spirit. And uh, so, continued on. When, uh, when people came to ask Adventism, what do you believe about the Trinity, what they could give back was uh, uh, this document by uh, uh, Samuel T. Spear that talked, was renamed to the Bible Doctrine of Trinity while in the in beginning it was called uh, the subordination of Christ. And uh, it was a 16-page article and it was reprinted uh, it was in reprint, and uh, it uh, they took it as a representation of what we believe. And so many people believe that uh, Adventists were Trinitarian back in those years, but the way they used the word Trinity was so different. So the title Bible Doctrine of the Trinity implied that the work would be sympathetic to the doctrine of the Trinity. Upon reading the track, one finds almost nothing which... 19th century Adventists will have found objectionable. So in this document, the people were living at that time and were non-Trinitarian. Although the document was called um, the Bible Doctrine of Trinity, but it had nothing to do with Trinity. You understand that? So while it is true that much of what Spear wrote in his article would have been acceptable to Seventh-day Adventists of that era, it is also true Wilcox himself did not agree in totality with Spears' document. While he wrote that there may be minor thoughts that we might wish to express differently, he never explained what this might be. 
yet reading his other articles later on, on indicates that there were most on they were most certainly significant differences that he had so there are some things in that article they did not believe in but um, it was just to use that document as a scapegoat so in this document some of the things that um, we would like to note are this that um, in uh, although uh, M.C. Wilcox used the word Trinity. In 1898, back in 1889, they, they were using this uh, Trinity word. But in 1890, 1898, this is what uh, Wilcox actually believes. That he believes in one God, the Father, and he accepts Christ to be under God, our Creator and Redeemer. And he said that the Spirit, it is in the Father, it is in Christ, it is in every member of the Church of Christ. You see how Wilcox now puts it? Although he has used the word Trinity, but he believes in God the Father, and he believes in Jesus Christ as the Son, and he believes that the Spirit is in the Father, it is in Christ, and it is the same way it is in the believer. So he is using the word Trinity but just as a smoke screen to what he actually believes, so that uh, the attacks may not be there a lot. He's, he's trying to compart our war so that he may silence the world as an editor of our, uh, of our, uh, our work. M.C. Wilcox is using a word which actually when you give it a meaning, it comes out so different to what actually the word itself means. So this is what we call reactionary theology. And uh, this is the battle of Trinity and Trinity thing. Uh, so it can be noted as as late as 1898, after the word Trinity had been introduced some almost 10 years ago, that Adventists, they used the word Trinity, but what they meant by the word Trinity was not what is meant today. Yes. Uh, in 1914, 1914, Wilcox was still ambiguous about the eternality of the Son of God. And uh, there is uh, a question that was asked Wilcox. This is the question he asked, he was asked, asked you know, as the editor of Review, like uh, now, you know, Ben, Ben is uh, the editor, and uh, Brother Brian on Young. So a question can be asked unto them. Uh, they are unbearable to the uh, publication that are coming from Gospel Sounders. So Wilcox was in that capacity. So uh, somebody who was reading uh, the, the, uh, the, the materials of Seventh-day Adventist asked uh, Cox, uh, uh, Wilcox, can we conclude from Revelation 3.14 and Colossians 1.15 that our Lord Jesus Christ had a beginning? And there was a time when God the Father was alone. Remember, this is a setting where D.M. Canwright, back seven, ten years ago, he has attacked Seventh-day Adventists. They don't believe in Trinity, is it? And in reaction, they put there a document by Samuel Spear that speaks about Trinity. And so it is to, uh, 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 to lessen the impact that uh, actually the damage is being done. And uh, 10 years later, in 1914, this is what we found when, the, when a subscriber is actually asking him from Revelation 3.14 and Colossians 1.15, do we have to believe that Christ had a beginning? The Sunday keepers are still attacking Seventh-day Adventists. This is what Wilcox answers, although they are using the word Trinity, okay? And he said, you, you understand the question? Did Christ have a beginning, is it? This is what Wilcox answers. And remember, they are using the word what? Trinity. Mm -hmm. Wilcox answers this. Yes, some of us conclude so. <laughs> so is it the Trinity that is believed today? No, no, no. The Trinity that believed today doesn't say that Christ said the beginning, is it? But Wilcox here is using the word Trinity, yet he says that Christ has a be beginning. 
So you see the way Adventists used the word Trinity back in 1890s, early 1900s. It's not the same way Trinity is used today. So Wilcox says, yes, some do conclude from Revelation 3.14 that there was a time when the Son did not exist, save in the all-comprehending purpose and potency of God. Christ is the thought of God made audible. This is what Wilcox is trying to say. He existed in the potency of God, in the thoughts. And at a time later, he had a beginning. And yet he's a Trinitarian. What kind of a Trinitarian is this? He is an untrinitarian Trinitarian. When I say an untrinitarian Trinitarian, I mean that he believes in the Father, he believes in a literal Son, he believes in their spirit, but economically, how many are they? So you are a Trinitarian, non-Trinitarian. Yes. And so, and yet there are others who still hold, and there is nothing to the contrary in the text, that the beginning of the creation of God means the one in whom the creation began, as declared in Colossians 1.17. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So this guy is actually good in his answers. And he, he tells them, see also 2 Timothy 1.9. Before the world began, literally, before the times of ages began, so I was brought forth. And so, whatever the use of the word Trinity in Wilcox's time, and the attacks that Canwright was having in the Seventh-day Adventism, proves that Seventh-day Adventists were non-Trinitarian. This is one of the things. Remember, we are talking about Dudley Canwright and his... Uh, uh, Defection, apostasy. And uh, th th there's something that uh, can write in his one of his uh, interviews to Chris uh, Christ Taylor. Uh, uh, this Christ Taylor actually uh, recording uh, about uh, Milton C. Wilcox. Uh, Milcox uh, believed that uh, the Holy Spirit is the life of God. Remember, this is a Trinitarian guy saying that the Holy Spirit is the life of God. And what this, did E.G. White say? When God gives us he, the Holy Spirit, he gives us what? He's the, the, the soul of what? There's something he said. The soul of his life, the life of his soul or the soul of his life. Something, something of that kind. And so Wilcox here is saying that the Holy Spirit is the life of God. Yet he is a Trinitarian. And so this is the reactionary theology. And uh, and uh, in, in, in one of uh, actually the documents, Taylor says that Wilcox believed that the spirit carries the power of God. And every soul which receives this spirit receives the power of God. The spirit carries the power of God. He, he, he never went into something like God, the Holy Spirit. No. He used the word Trinity, but in his explanation, he was an untrinitarian. And uh, when asked, then, how do you reconcile between saying this and the Holy Spirit being a person? This is interesting now. He answers this because it comes to the believer as a person of Christ. <laughs> this is interesting. So he is asked, you believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Eh? But by the statements that you are saying, how comes that the Spirit is a person? And he replies, it comes to a believer as the person of Christ. And this is what we believe that uh, actually the Holy Spirit is the personality of Jesus Christ. It's the personality of the Father. It is, their, it is themselves in a distinct personality. It is in the fullness of the Godhead. It carries everything that comprises the Father inwardly. And the aspect of their personality. And so... 
That is how it becomes a person. It's a distinct person. The word person in their days did not limit themselves to think of a person who has a form, a humanoid form. But they believe that you can be a person. The, another meaning of the person in Webster Dictionary number six is character and office. And this is how they believe the Holy Spirit was. Mm -hmm. Yes. And... Uh, Then somebody asked him in 1898. This guy had a hard time as an editor of Review. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish Ben could get these questions. <laughs> he was asked, may we not understand that the Holy Ghost is a person then? He has been asked, how do you reconcile that the Holy Spirit as a person? And he said that he comes to the believers, the person of who? Jesus Christ. Then he is asked, May we not understand that the Holy Ghost is a person? Because the answer you have given doesn't show that he's a person. Eh? May we now not believe that the Holy Ghost is a person, as well as the Father and the Son, as they are a person? Eh? As a being, yes. Yes, that is what they were hinting. Don't we believe this? And then this is what Wilcox answers. And I, I respect this guy to some degree. He said, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Comfort, the Spirit of Christ are all one and the same Spirit. <laughs> so, eh? yeah, you can see how this guy tried to compare the theology of D.M. Gunn, right? But stay to the truth. Using the word Trinity, but what is coming outside there, even the one who is reading, is understanding this guy is dodging something. So you cannot say that Seventh-day Adventists, as far as 1898, believed in Trinity as it is believed today. Because the Review and Herald editor, what he's giving out is something so different. And yet he's calling it what? Trinity. So Wilcox says, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Comfort, the Spirit of Christ are all but one same Spirit. For there is one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope, Ephesians 4, 4. The Spirit is the outflowing life of God in Christ and has the power of bringing to the child of God the personality and the presence of Christ. In this way, it may be, be said to be a person. While as God's life, it is said to be shed forth, poured out, it is we cannot comprehend the infinite. End to the answer. Now, in 1908, Wilcox was asked the question, question, the Trinity, we speak of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. This is the question. Do we understand that the Holy Ghost or Spirit is a personal being as God now comes to what you have said. Mm -hmm. And as the Fa as God the Father and Jesus the Son. In Christ's talk with the disciples in John 14, he uses the personal pronoun in referring to the comforter. Answer. There are various interpretations and differences of opinion in regard to the matter. Mm -hmm. To the mind of the writer, the Spirit is the life of God, or better, the life of the, uh, the Father and the Son. It is that which makes deity everywhere present, meaning that it is there among present. In Acts chapter 2, it is spoken of that which come into the room and filled all who were there. In the 33rd verse, in the 33rd verse, Peter speaks of it as the power which Christ has poured forth. It is spoken of as a person because by the Spirit, the Father and the Son come personal to us. In John 16, 7, Jesus tells us, It is expedient for you that I go away. For I, If I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Jesus was a person located in one place. The Spirit was that which was shared abroad among all his children. But it brought to every one of those children the presence of Christ. So we read again, The Holy Spirit shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall declare it unto you. So, Wilcox in 1911 asserts that the Holy Spirit is the energy of God. Yet, he is publishing all these things under what? The title? 
Trinity. So the listener and the viewer can now get the picture of what the Adventists believe, why Canwright went out, and some of the things that now he himself was not actually panning out, but he was being pushed to ask Seventh-day Adventists and to create questions in the mind of other Sunday keepers so that they may attack Adventism because he had a problem with Adventism. And uh, one subscriber of uh, the Review and Herald asked this. This is, uh, let me see the year. I hope you are getting the information. This is back in 1914. One of the subscribers asked this to Wilcox. What is your idea about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost being three in one? Hey, answer from Wilcox. It matters very little what our idea is in this matter. What does the Bible teach? Should we should, should be the question with us all. Christ says, I and I and my father are one, and prays that his disciples may be as one as he and his father are one. John 10 30, 17, 11, 21. The unity is one we may apprehend, though not comprehend. The Bible doctrine of Trinity. Number 90 of the Bible Student Library, Price 2 Cents, Pacific Press Oak Plancal, will give you some good thoughts and suggestions on the matter. So, the article he is referring to is by Samuel Spear, the subordination of Christ, which has been renamed the doctrine of Trinity. And in that article, there is nothing to do with Trinitarian. It is non Trinitarian statements. But he's referring to a Trinitarian to that document. That is what we believe, and we believe as maybe as you do. Um, so this was actually the reactionary theology that went on for uh, Adventist uh, Church. And, uh, let me see if uh, I can put this to an end. So there was a time after 1914 that actually uh, back in in the Christian Workers Magazine from 1915, 1911, 1915, the, the battle continued going, going on. What does Adventism believe? And uh, and uh, people knew that Adventists were not, not Trinitarians, although they were using the word Trinity. And uh, So there's a time that they were asked, do you believe in Trinity? And they said, yes, we believe in it. Huh? And uh, now D.M. Canwright was called forth to tell what does Adventist believe? And uh, now listen to what, uh, this is the report by D.M. Canwright. At this time, he's called Reverend D.M. Canwright. Huh? Editor of the Christian Workers Magazine, in the June number of your magazine, under the above title, you said that in a previous issue by request, you gave a summary of Seventh-day doctrines, which you said they reject the doctrine of Trinity. Now, he is being said, uh, uh, they are talking about uh, D.M. Canwright, when all these statements were coming out, he continued to insist that uh, Seventh-day are not Trinitarian. So somebody was uh, now putting him forth on damn life. For this... The Christian magazine now wrote to Elder Canwright, Reverend Canwright, that because he was saying that Adventists are not Trinitarian, yet Adventists were using the word Trinity, is it? And uh, he tells him, in the June number of your magazine, under the above title, you say that in a previous issue, by request, you gave a summary of Seventh-day Adventist doctrines in which you said they reject the doctrine of Trinity. For this, Elder Wheeler, an Adventist minister, took you to task and convinced you of error on this point. So you apologized and corrected your statement, Reverend D.M. Canwright. In my book, 
Seventh day Adventist renowned page 25, I give a summary of uh, their doctrines and use exactly these words. So I judge you accepted by statement as reliable. I now reaffirm my statement. Dr. Conrad says they reject the doctrine of the Trinity as held by evangelicals as the previous line in my book states. Do you see the difference? D.M. Conrad is saying, those Adventists are saying they are what? They believe in Trinity. But, listen to me, they reject the doctrine of the Trinity as held by who? Evangelicals, churches, as the previous line in my book states. But Elder Wheeler says, I regard you, our position upon the Trinity as in harmony with that of evangelical churches. His statement is untrue, D.M. Conrad says. Either he does not know the doctrine of his church or has not read their standard works. You know, D.M. Conrad was an editor of Seventh-day Adventists. And Wheeler has said that they believe in Trinity. Conrad says that they don't believe in Trinity. And Conrad says the statement of Elder Wheeler as a Seventh-day Adventist is untrue that they believe in Trinity. Either he does not know the doctrine of his church or has not read their standard works, or else he misleads you. I, uh, I was a minister and a writer among them for over 20 years. Since I became a Baptist minister, I have kept in close touch with all their teachings. I now take five Advent papers and read their latest books. He is a Sunday keeper, but he's taking our materials to read them. I know all their doctrine as well as they do themselves, much better than their young ministers like Elder Wheeler. While an Adventist, I often preached against the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity and other ministers did the same. As a proof that they believe in the Trinity the same as others, Elder Wheeler quotes from Miss White this sentence touching Christ, he was the incarnate God. Now, I want you to listen carefully this part. So this is Conrad speaking. As a proof that they believe in the Trinity the, sa the same as others, Elder Wheeler quotes from Miss White this sentence touching Christ. He was the incarnate God, Conrad says. Well, then did their incarnate God become totally dead and unconscious for three days? Was there no living God for three days? Or was there another deity up in heaven at the same time? Is that the evangelical doctrine of Trinity? Or does not Elder Wheeler know what Trinitarians believe? <laughs> so, the evangelicals and the trin co-Trinitarian belief is that Christ never died. From the answer of D.M. Conrad. Because listen carefully. As a proof that they believe in the Trinity the same as others, Elder Wheeler quotes from Miss White, this sentence touching Christ, he was the incarnate God. Well, then did their incarnate God become totally dead and unconscious for three days? Which means Trinitarians believe that Christ was not dead and he was not unconscious. <laughs> True. Amen to that. Was there no living God for three days? they believed there was a living God. And the living God is comprised of how many? Three. Or was there another deity up in heaven at the same time? They cannot distribute the person of God. Mm. And so if one of the God dies, it means that there is no God. This is the core fundamental preaching of the Trinitarianism. Yet people do not realize that. Yes, because if they are one, yes, if one dies, then the, you are mm -hmm. tired of the God is compromised. Yes, yes, and so the Adventists did not believe in the Trinity as evangelicals do back until 1931, mm -hmm. and the way they used the word Trinity was to mean God the Father. His Son, Jesus Christ, and their own omnipresent spirit. And you see, um, uh, Wilcox, every time and time, answering the questions and saying, this is what I believe. This is what we believe. And it is not Trinity, while it is 
coined Trinity. And it is not the, ta the, the, the version of the Trinity they believe today. You understand that? The version of the Trinity they believed in that day is not the Trinity or that um, we, uh, Seventh-day Adventists uh, believe, not we, but Seventh-day Adventists believe today. Because the Seventh-day Adventists of today believe in the God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Person of one substance, of the same substance, something of that kind. But in that time, they believed that Christ was the literal Son of God and the Spirit was the Spirit of God, not an individual being, as it is said today. So, D.M. Canwright continues, I'm, I'm soon coming to an end. What shall we say to Elder Wheeler's assertion that Adventists believe in the Trinity as held by evangelical churches? Again, you ask Elder Wilder if they had put out an official statement of their faith. He says, the denomination has declined to adopt such a creed. Here is another statement which is untrue. The Adventist creed is entitled Fundamental Principles of, of Seventh-day Adventists. It says the following proposition may be taken as a summary of the principal features of our religious faith. So, Elder Wheeler has been untrue in his answers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is, that's the debates that were going there. And so, it continues like that. And uh, then uh, I like to finish. So, the doctrine of uh, Adventism and the uh, Trinity, although it started as a reactionary theology to combat what D.M. Cunwright was doing, and they started using the word Trinity, it later became a full-blown Trinity, Trinity doctrine. The devil was enticing them slowly by slowly, until now they became full-blown uh, Trinitarians. Now, we can read what Adventists believe today. <clears throat> uh, in 1892, in the year 1892, Seventh-day Adventists placed themselves plainly before the world as believers in evangelical doctrine of the Trinity and the date of Christ in the most unequivocal sense of those terms by adopting and uh, publishing for the general use of the church and missionary society a treatise called the Bible Doctrine of Trinity. And it started slowly by slowly to identify themselves with evangelicals, although at that time they did not believe in uh, the doctrine of uh, Trinity. But as time went by, they finally came to believe in Trinity. And so we find in the years that uh, they, they, they became full-blown uh, uh, Trinitarians uh, the years that uh, followed, the evangelical meetings that followed, uh, they started believing in this uh, uh, in this statement of uh, of Trinity. And uh, I like to finish somewhere. I like to finish somewhere and uh, address the issue of DM Canwright in a few minutes, and then uh, we close up uh, as we had agreed that. Uh, we shall finish by five. Uh, where am I? Later on, as the years advanced, this is what we have now. Which year was this? In 1921. G. W. Reza wrote in 1921, with deep concern, a relative, with deep concern relative to the dangers which exist in certain modern cults, some of the constituents of the International Federation of Christian Workers requested their president John Edward Brown to review such isms as he 
considered as menace to the Christian church. The following extracts are copied from his pamphlet entitled The Cal Kingdom, published uh, in uh, response to this request. This is what he writes. In a certain city, a very godly man came to me with the request that I include Seventh-day Adventism in the series announced for review and seemed incredulous when I told him the Church of Jesus Christ had no fight to make on Seventh-day Adventism. There are no fundamental grounds of disagreement between the organized Church of Christ and the Seventh-day Adventists. On all the cardinal doctrines of the Bible, the miraculous conception and the virgin birth, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, the date of Christ, the atonement of Christ, the second coming and the personality of the Holy Spirit, and all the infallibility of the Bible, the Seventh Day Adventist rings as true still. So they started this reactional theology of using the word Trinity, but in 1921, something starts changing. They start adopting this doctrine. And even the other churches, instead of writing that the Seventh Day Adventist is a cult, they write the Seventh Day Adventist rings as true as still. They believe as we believe, apart from keeping the Sabbath and us keeping Sunday. And so you can see how Satan ensnares. And he continued, when you walk up in the presence of Mormonism, Edism and Ruselism, you walk up into the presence of that which has strange theories to present, strange doctrine to promulgate, all but literally a new God to worship, but not with Adventism. So uh, Adventism starts agreeing with what? The world. They have been bombarded every time and time. You are Trinitarians. You, they have said we are not until they start using the word Trinity in a comical sense, and then they go ahead and adapt it. And so, uh, uh, the claim of uh, uh, Brown in 1918 is a bit unusual in as much as Seventh-day Adventism themselves were by no united on Trinitarianism as the minutes from 1919 meetings revealed. So then, why did he assert that Seventh-day Adventism rings as true as still on the issues of the date of Christ and the personality of the Holy Spirit? Could it be that reactionary theology was also at work here, and one or more Seventh-day Adventists persuaded Mr. Brown that they believe in the Trinity, just as other churches did, similar to how Lee Will attempted to convince James Gray? Uh, this may be seen as uh, one of those uh, reactionary theologies, but uh, later we found that everything went uh, uh, from sour to bad. Uh, So you you find that uh, <clears throat> from 1936, Adventism started cracking down. They started to have some crackdowns in our doctrines. Later on, we ended having uh, uh, the Evangelical Conference that followed, and then. In 1980, you understand what happened in Dallas. They adopted what? They became fully blown Trinitarians. And so let us finish with the, the story of uh, the story of uh, Dudley Canwright because he was the main. Uh, the main uh, person we are talking about uh, in this session. Let us finish this. <clears throat> Later on, you understand that in 1955, 1956, and 1957, there was an evangelical earthquake, the evangelical meetings, and uh, Leroy Froome and the people at that time actually had did a damage to this denomination. And um, I, I want to finish by uh, uh, taking you through, uh, we were talking about uh, Dudley Canwright, is it? 
They said that he left the church because we do not believe in God, the Holy Spirit. That was not the reason. He left because of so many things. But it is later when uh, the Sunday churches started um, using him as a tool who understood Seventh-day Adventism well to push them to the wall. And uh, in reactional theology, the uncounted factor by Brother Jason Smith, we find that SDS started using the word Trinity and later they fell to the hook of the word itself and they adopted the evangelical uh, belief of the Trinity. And so, Dudley Canwright went away and uh, became a vowed uh, critic of Seventh-day Adventists and uh, Sister White. And uh, it was because he didn't believe in Ten Commandments. That is the reason he gave. Uh, he didn't believe uh, in, uh, in the law, the Sabbath, the health reform, prophecy, and he didn't believe in the three angels' messages. Trinity was not one of the things that made him leave the church, as Pastor Marambi says. And he only brought in the attack on Trinity because he was employed by the Baptist church and other Protestant churches were using him to, uh, 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 to, to, to go at Seventh-day Adventism. So let us finish. Uh, and uh, in this finishing part, uh, let me blow it on the screen so that uh, we may be benefited together. I'll take some of your 10 minutes, if you don't mind. Eyewitnesses to an Ellen White prophecy by Dr. Akibald William Truman. Dr. Truman was born in 1884. He started his medical career at Battle Creek Hospital and Medical Center, but got his medical degree in Colorado in 1908. He practiced medicine in Glendale, California during the 1940s. After retirement, he moved to Loma Linda, California. He died April 20, 1977 at the age of 93 years of age. This account was transcribed from a taped sermon he gave in Loma Linda at the Azu Hills Church in the late 1970s. Dr. Truman was in his 90s when he gave this account in a church. Now, permit me to relate a personal experience in connection with the story of Elder Dudley Marvin Canwright of Battle Creek Days. Uh, for years, Elder Canwright was an intimate friend of and a collaborator with Elder James and Ellen White. Later, he became her bitterest opponent and did the most of any man to discredit her work and to malign her good name. So the issue was the issue of personalities. Elder Canwright for years was a strong Seventh-day Adventist preacher and a conference president. Before his defection from the church, he wrote on January 6, 1885, which account you will find in Elder Reebok's book, Believe His Prophets. While I have carefully read the first, second, and third volumes of the Spirit of Prophecy, heaven seemed very near to me. This is the words of, Will, uh, of our DM. If the Spirit of God does not speak to us in these writings, then I should despair of ever designing it. I have read many of her books, but never one which has interested me so intensely as Volume 4 of The Great Controversy by Sister White. The ideas concerning the nature and attributes of God, the character of Christ, and the rebellion of Lucifer in heaven carry with them their own proof of inspiration. D.M. Canwright speaking. Why did Elder Canwright leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church? A question is asked. I believe it was because he wanted to become a great man. And remember, this is what he told G.I. Butler in the beginning, that if it were not for this Adventist message, I'll be a, what? A great man. And G.I. Butler told him, it is because of this message that people have seen that you are a great man because he had just come from debating 3,000 people. He had come from debating in a congregation of 3,000 people and people saw how he was good at it and they praised him. And so it was out of defending these things that he was great, G.I. Butler was telling him. And so Elder Cambridge says, I believe it was, uh, Truman says, uh, sorry for that, uh, if you are viewing, let us go back. Why did Elder Canwright leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church? I believe it was because he wanted to become a great man. Here are my reasons for saying this. He was an eloquent and forceful speaker. 
after an address which he gave in a popular church in Chicago before the audience of more than 2,000 on non Seventh day Adventists, the people literally swarmed him. They rushed to the platform and held him for another half hour. After he and his fellow ministers and by friends, and my friends, Elder D. W. Rabish left the temple, he said to the pastor, Rabish, if it were not for this despised Sabbath question, I could become a great man. He did leave the Sabbath truth and did become a great man. But how great, we shall find in a moment. We shall find just in some few minutes. In 1888, Sister White wrote a kindly, friendly, yearning letter to Pastor Conrad, entreating him for his wife and children's sake to consider the choice he had made and for his own soul's sake to ponder the path that his feet was treading. Said she, I call to mind your temptation through false and ambitious hopes to become greater away from our people than with them. You will find that in volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 621. Decades passed and Miss White's life ended in 1915 at the age of 88. The White family invited me to attend her funeral in Battle Creek, Michigan. I crossed much of the continent to be present and was standing a few feet from her open casket in Dime Tabernacle. This is being reported. When an old broken man, D.M. Canwright, came along in the line. So who is reporting this? Truman. He's reporting that um, when Miss White died, D.M. Canwright went away because he wanted to be a great man. But um, now Sister White have died and then Truman have been invited in the funeral. And he crosses many miles to come and witness the funeral. And uh, he says, uh, while he was there, uh, while he was standing a few feet from her open casket in the great dime tabernacle, an old broken man, Dame Canwright, came along in the line. He paused, placed his hands, both hands on the buyer and the casket, and looked and looked at the peaceful face now at rest. This is D.M. Conrad. He raised his broken, adhesive patched spectacles and peered some more inside the bar. And with warm tears trickling from his face down on mournful tones, he said, there lies a noble Christian woman gone. He left that is, Dr. M. DM, uh, DM Conrad left. He left, went to the other street entrance to the church and passed the casket a second time. He was shabbily dressed. This is the greatness now he has. He was poverty stricken and living alone. His wife was being cared for by relatives because he was unable to support them. My dear friend and associate in the Washington Sanitarium, Dr. D. H. Chris, made a friendly visit to D.M. Canwright in his home. Said Dr. Chris, there was not even a scatter rag on his floor. His dream of worldly greatness had turned to bitter ashes upon his lips. Why did he not come back to the Seventh-day Adventist church? He said he couldn't come back. He died a discouraged, disheartened, disillusioned, dejected, and destitute old man without hope, without money, and apparently forsaken by his newfound non-SDA church friends. The poet wrote, there is a line by us unseen. It crosses every path, the hidden boundary between God's mass and his wrath. Terrible thought, Mr. Forrest, but it is biblical. From Amos I quote, behold, the days come, said the Lord, said the Lord God, that I'll send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, and they shall wander from the sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. I have one more brief reference I want to read from book one of Selected Messages, page 48. Satan is constantly pressing in the superiors, the false to lead away from the church. The very last of Satan will be, will be what, not the last, deception, but the very last, what will be the very last deception of Satan, the deception to our people we ought to know, the very last of Satan will be to make of none effect the 
testimony of the Spirit of God. Where no vision is, is the people perish. Satan work will ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. There will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies which is satanic. Have you ever heard anything about that? Have you ever seen any evidence of it? There will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies which is satanic. The working of Satan will be of, to unsettle the faith of the church in them. This was the work of D.M. Cunwright. Hired, changed into a Baptist, the other churches used him to attack Adventism and Sister White particularly. And in seeking to be a great man, in apostatizing, seeking to be a great man, D.M. Cunwright died without a rag in his floor, on his floor. Died a dejected man. He died praising the prophet, but yet not believing in the prophet. It reminds me of Gehazi. Gehazi sought after the things of the world. After Elisha had healed a man, Gehazi followed the man that is Naaman to take off the things that Naaman was with. And Gehazi turned leprous all of his life. And what is the last spot that Gehazi is spotted in the king's gate? Feeding like a dog and doing things that are. Once he was an assistant to the prophet, but now it is the story of D.M. Cunwright. Fell off the pace because he wanted to be great, dies in greatness of poverty. And so the accusations that have been put outside there that uh, D.M. Cunwright left the church because of Trinity and Trinity thing is not true. But uh, it is a misinformation to the people who have been listening to our pastors. And uh, how I pray that God will make it possible that this material will reach unto the people and they will be able to know the truth and be set free. While actually they are saying that we are fighting the testimonies by believing the Father, the Son, and their Spirit, actually they are rejecting them by insisting that there is God, the Holy Spirit. And the reason why Seventh-day Adventist Church has not prospered, it is because they actually profess to believe in the prophet, but they don't believe in the prophet. How I pray that the, our end shall not be an end like this one. May the Lord be with us. May we find a time of repenting of the things we say, of the things we think about other people and the in misinformation that we give out to the people. And uh, for more information, you can conduct Brother Jason Smith, you can conduct Brother Paul Chung, or you can conduct me so that uh, you may get more light on the issue of uh, uh, Doodly Marvin Conrad. Otherwise, God bless you and uh, God be with you in everything. And uh, we can just utter a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We believe that you have a message for us, Lord. And uh, falsehood is one of breaking thy commandments. Help us to speak of the truth and truth alone. Help many people who are seeking for greatness in the things of this world understand that they are only temporary and they will should look at our past history and learn of it because it is an ensemble to us. We thank you for the Sabbath and we thank you for thy presence. We thank you for being with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and uh, keep you for his uh, service.